Hello, Tennessee Voices viewers and listeners. This is David Plazas, the Opinion and Engagement Director for the USA Today Network Tennessee and the Tennessean. I'm delighted to have a conversation with three guests today on the issue of homelessness in Nashville. We have Renee Pratt, who is the Executive Director of Metro Social Services, uh, Jay Survey, who is the uh, Interim Homeless Impact Division Director, and April Calvin, who is the Assistant Director there at the Homeless Impact Division. Uh, hope, how are you all doing today? Great, thank you for having us. Yep. So, and uh, I want to know more about uh, the work that you're doing uh, uh, with regard to homelessness in Nashville. This has been an issue that has received a lot of coverage in the media and also has had a lot of conversation within the Metro Council. And perhaps uh, if we could start with uh, Renee Pratt, uh, just to give a couple of uh, opening statements related to the overall vision of what's happening, and then we'll go uh, into the HID. Thank you so much for this opportunity. We really appreciate it. We are looking at a major issue in our city and it is homelessness. The past few months, we recognized this problem to be a crisis and we're in a crisis situation. I've worked with many years with Jay Survey around sheltering the homeless through our cold weather shelter, the past two years through our COVID sheltering, and now working with him as interim director of social services and the homeless impact division. I look at this as very promising because he is used to working in crisis situations and helps to identify how we move forward and how we hopefully eradicate homelessness. Maybe not with him in the slot as interim director, but helping us to lay the ground and do the work to hopefully help us to be successful in this effort. I'd also like to comment on our new assistant director, April Calvin. She brings to us 22 years of experience in this area from the Salvation Army. She and Jay have actually hit the ground running and are a great team in looking at how we address these major issues and how we handle this crisis situation. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Chief Jay Servan. Hey, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are, what time the podcast comes on. Uh, I am, like she said, the interim director of the Homeless Impact Division, uh, known as Chief J Survey in Nashville, Tennessee, from my time at the, the Office of Emergency Management, and now here at the uh, at the Homeless Impact Division. One of my main goals, and one of our city's goals, and one of everyone's goals, is to help people in need, and that is my number one goal for each and every day that I show up to work. So if we're doing that through uh, through our collaboration and coordination with all of our partners within the city and provide that service, then, then I feel good about that. Uh, the thing I've been tasked to do over the next several months is to be able to make sure that we are moving in a positive direction and, and giving the most resources to those that are most vulnerable at the most critical time. And like Director Pratt said, Nashville is in a, in a, in a critical state with its homeless issues, as we all know. I mean, you don't have to be in my position to hear or see or feel what those effects are. But as a community, I want you to truly understand is that that is a person that is probably at a very vulnerable state in their life. And each time that we help one, that spreads. And then we help another one and we help another one. Housing being the ultimate goal for each and every individual that's experiencing uh, homelessness in our city. Uh, but I wanna meet them where they are. Our organization getting together with our outreach workers and and our nonprofit partners and reaching those people uh, as, as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Thank you very much. And we'll uh, end with April, please. Well, I would like to share that housing is a complex problem with, and it's very fluid. Homelessness is a complex problem and it's very fluid. Um, with different solutions, there's different paths um, that we should take as a community. Um, best practices, innovative approaches, definitely with um, different paths to housing. So as a department, that's where we want to put our focus more on the housing being solution oriented. One of the things that I definitely want to talk to you about is just the conversation related to those solutions. As you've mentioned, it's very complicated. I've covered the housing issue for many, many years and understand, especially in a booming city where the uh, cost of living is getting higher and higher. We know that housing costs are getting higher of what are the tools that you have available to you, um, you know, as in, in light of people who are experiencing homelessness 
and also trying to find a, a solution like a, an encampment. And recently there's been a lot of conversations about you know, uh, closing down encampments to put people in housing. Will you talk a little bit about that process and the tools, please? Yeah, I'll start with um, the main bulk of our tools would be our community partners. A lot of this work um, relies solely on the shoulders of our community partners. There's federal dollars, there's, um, you know, metro dollars that go into this body of work, but we definitely want to celebrate the hard work that our community partners help with us in engaging. We also um, would like to share one of the other tools would be our governance, you know, um, our executive committee, our homeless planning council, um, definitely being able to um, collaborate and network within that department in order to help provide resources um, is what we would like to celebrate. Thank you very much. And I know that uh, Chief Survey, in an op-ed that you wrote for the Tennessee and a few months ago, you talked about a plan that you're developing. Could you talk a little bit about the progress of that, please? Uh, so there's a, a few plans that are underway and getting refreshed and being looked at. One of them is the overall strategic plan for our uh, community of, uh, of continuum care uh, community and our, our nonprofit partners together with the uh, Homeless Planning Council and us being the admin administrative support for that. Uh, movement. So we're looking forward to that being refreshed. And then also an outdoor uh, community uh, strategy to where we are looking at vulnerabilities, uh, large scale and down to the person's vulnerability. So the, the vulnerability of the encampment and also the vulnerability of the person and then add those together and then hopefully come up with a plan that helps mitigate that uh, as quickly and stream, you know, streamline it as, as quickly as, as we can to get those folks into housing and get those people, uh, um, get the, those that are experiencing homelessness, um, the help that they need where they are. So it's, whether it's a, a, an addiction issue or um, a, a criminal history issue or as simple as a driver's license or social security number, we have those resources within our community that'll uh, help those individuals uh, achieve and get into a better place to get them housed, to have them in a better position to be housed. And we're housing focused. Um, you know, changing the narrative will definitely help. I'm um, not focusing on closing encampments, but having the resources and the housing opportunities available for those individuals um, as we find them safe and affordable options. Thank you for that. And if I could turn to uh, Renee Pratt for a moment uh, in your role with the Know Your Community Report, uh, the report is showing a deepening divide uh, in equity. Could you talk a little bit about uh, that, the latest report and also how you've seen this trend over the years? Uh, yes, over the last two years, the report has changed quite a bit. I think that's due to COVID and what we've experienced almost over the last two years. The Know Your Community Report is what it is, is data that we provide to community leaders and for them to use for look to look at improvements, to look at specifically what's going on in their backyard in each and every district and help them address the issues that they're seeing currently in the city. We don't enact policy, but we do provide the data and the information. We just want to ensure that people are aware of the socioeconomic impact that, has had, that uh, COVID has had over the last two years and how it has drastically changed. And the Know Your Community Report provides all those data points, education, economics, um, employment, of what's going on in each district. So those council members can better determine what those needs are and how we address those needs. As I've noticed when I've been doing reading and also research on homelessness here in Nashville, this, it, you know, this is a, a, an issue that's affecting communities across America right now. Uh, I remember back uh, over a decade ago, um, actually beyond that, the Bush administration had a program with regard to 10-year plans of homelessness. And I think today we're going to really a uh, housing uh, focus uh, when it comes to, to addressing homelessness. Um, you know, for the general public who's really not aware of how this works. Could you go, go a little bit deeper into, you know, when you identify someone who is homeless, what is the point where you are able to get that person or a group of people into housing? Actually, um, I'll start there. Um, 
our department um, holds the HMIS database system and the coordinated entry database system as well. So we rely on our community as the planning and coordinating agency. We rely on our community partners to enter that data into the coordinated entry um, process. They are screened based on a vulnerability index. And then there's some coordinated care meetings that happen bi-weekly and the um, referrals are made at that point. The referrals are made to the community partners based on that client's vulnerability index. Our community is housing first um, focus and focusing more on those with the most vulnerabilities. Um, so at that point, the connection is made to an agency that has openings for referrals or funding availability to assist with those needs. The needs go anywhere from housing to recovery, to mental health um, assistance, um, employment options. Um, we connect with agencies that provide SOAR, which is um, helping someone that um, has extreme vulnerabilities connect into um, disability income. So helping them to be able to stabilize in housing, which will then allow for them to clean up some for employment search or get connected to the resources that they need in order to sustain that unit. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, it's, it's very interesting that uh, Nashville for years, like many communities has done its uh, uh, count on an annual basis. And that I know has been difficult because of COVID. And we sometimes get different um, definitions of that based upon whether someone is sleeping outside or in a shelter or perhaps they're couch surfing or uh, or they may be uh, in a hotel, a short-term hotel. Do you have a sense as to what the extent of the homeless residents are in uh, Nashville, uh, just to get a sense of how big the work that you're doing? So last year, because of COVID, we did not do a point in time count. Um, last month was our first point in time count in two years. Those numbers are being um, reviewed and vetted through our service partners and our HMIS department. Um, I would say maybe within the next month, those numbers should be produced and ready um, for the community. But that's just a snapshot of the um, numbers of those that's experiencing homelessness, what they were, what, who they encountered throughout that night. Um, but because homelessness is fluid, that number changes quite a bit. And that number really only focuses on um, HUD's narrow definition of homelessness, which is individuals that are experiencing category one, meaning that they are street level homelessness, shelter level homelessness, or living in a place that's not meant for habitation. Um, other than that, there is a much broader scope um, as far as homelessness that we all know as well. Those that may be doubled up, those that may be staying with a friend or, um, you know, doesn't have a place that they can call their own. So our city recently, um, I would say due to um, ESG funds, we've been able to have a much more robust HMIS system. Um, more agencies are entering in that data. As a department, we've hired some coordinated entry um, individuals that can help with entering that information as well. Metro Social Services have you know, notoriously been known for holding the family coordinated entry line. So we are getting better as a city at tracking that number. I wouldn't want to give a number just right now on the spot, but I would think as a city, we're getting closer to um, being able to put a thumb on the pulse of that. Thank you for that. We'll definitely be uh, updating the public once we have that number that's available, because uh, I know that, that has varied over the years between around 2000 ish. And some advocates have said as many as 25,000, but that could be that fluid number of people who are you know, in between. I know that uh, when I used to do work with um, uh, or volunteer with Buena Vista Elementary, that was the feeder school for uh, the mission there on Rosa Parks. And so this notion of, you know, we, we have a situation where it's not just about adults, but it's also about children. And can you talk a little bit about uh, the kind of services that you have available or the kind of partnerships you have available to help uh, children and their families who are homeless? There are several programs around town or agencies and organizations around town that um, provide services to families. Um, I don't want to name them because I'm sure I'll forget some and, you know, leave someone out. So, um, but there are several agencies around that really specialize in um, street level, shelter level homelessness. Um, as the planning and coordinating agency, we definitely could help with providing numbers, but um, you know, I would just say the most of that work rely or lies within the agencies. 
Very good. Thank you very much. Um, you know, one of the, the challenges, of course, as uh, of late because of COVID has been the eviction crisis that we've seen, not just in Nashville, but across the country. Would you talk a little bit about the impact it's had on your work? And on a related note, uh, if you could talk a little bit about the landlord incentive program. Um, I don't know who would be the best person who would like to, to talk about, but I, I, I open it up. I'll start a little bit with agencies and then we'll go to landlord incentive. Um, so prior to um, my work here, I was a part of an um, fan club, which is financial assistance network. There's a lot of dollars, federal and local um, and private dollars that went into helping to maintain the homes of our Nashville neighbors prior to um, or during the time of COVID. So um, I don't have that data on how many actually lost their home. Um, what we do know about homelessness is, you know, it's three parts. One is um, loss of self. Two is loss of family. Three is loss of community. Most all of us, if we were to experience um, the loss of a home, we have those other two support systems that would definitely be able to soften the blow. Um, but some of our families and our individuals that we encounter don't have the two networks um, in between. So I believe that there was a lot of COVID funds that went into our community to soften the blow of homelessness for a lot of our families. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. And then talk landlord about, oh, yeah. incentive. Yeah, mm -hmm. so um, our mayor was instrumental in dedicating some um, ARP funds, I guess home ARP funds mm -hmm. um, for um, landlord incentive, which was to increase the landlord incentive, um, $500,000 to be exact. Um, within one month, I don't know if you all know this, but I want to celebrate our, um, <laughs> our um, Low Barrier Housing Collective Department. Within one month, they increased 50 units of housing just in the month of February. Um, so in one month, because of those funds, being able to advertise that the mayor dedicated those funds to new units um, and um, re-incentivize some of those that um, were already partners of ours as well. well. Thank you very much for that. That That is great to hear, to see that people are getting uh, the opportunity to be housed and uh, especially at this time when we're seeing this great divide continue for your data and for the research that I've done over the years. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, that I enjoy doing about this show, uh, Tennessee Voices, that in addition to talking about very serious topics like the one you're in, is also asking leaders about themselves and how they as leaders are coping during this time, because too often times they don't take care of themselves. So what are you reading, watching, doing just to uh, uh, take care of yourself during this time of pandemic? That is a great, great question. question. Yeah. <laughs> <Come on up>. yeah. <laughs> No, uh, that's a great question because uh, it has, since COVID started, has really uh, made itself up front. And um, that's why Director Pratt had said we, we're in a critical state uh, with all that was going on before COVID and, and homelessness. And then you have COVID and then the, the evictions and then uh, we saw a rise in drug abuse, substance abuse, and it's just uh, it taxes on the provider also because all of our partners, not just us three sitting at this table, but everybody in the community that's in the nonprofit world or in the government world that helps or focuses on homelessness is, is full time and, and full time meaning, you know, 12, 15 hour days have become a normal. So taking care of ourselves so that we can take care of others is, is vitally important. Like April said, I started getting on the treadmill, you know, and put on that uh, COVID-20, uh, COVID-15, well, I passed that way, way, from, way up front. <laughs> but uh, uh, so that's where I take care of myself. And then really going uh, out and visiting, you know, taking our efforts and me personally going to the street and sitting down with someone and, and talking about uh, how we can help them. That's, that's where I get my most mental help there. And then, of course, my, my faith-based strength that I have. And then, of course, uh, the treadmill, which is absolutely kicking my tail right now. So that's okay. <laughs> We're good. I, but I think it's important, uh, the mental health part of it, too. Yeah. So go ahead. Uh, 
I think for, for me, I'm more concerned about my staff than myself. Um, we've been in this effort since COVID began. Our doors never close. We continue to meet customers here in our building and take phone calls all day long. Our volume has gone up over 25% in terms of people reaching out for help. Our call volume has gone up tremendously over the last two months because people don't know how to really navigate the system and determine what their needs are. So it's, for, it's our staff that provide that assistance and guide and provide case management and guidance for those people that we encounter every day. So it's extremely important for me to talk to my folks about self-care and well-being and how I can contribute to that and how we can help them with that here in the department. Um, it's enough, as we all know, the mental health statistics that have gone up um, for Hispanics, 25%. Um, of children and 25% of African American children are living in poverty, and many of the parents are experiencing mental health issues there. So, just trying to be prepared to face what's to come. And so, generally, if you're a servant, you always put yourself last. And I, I really don't practice self care like I should. So, hopefully, going through this process with staff, I will learn some things as well and learn how to take better care of myself. So, thank you for the question. Thank you. I think April. Well, my answer is a little bit like theirs, right? When you are a servant, you um, put others before yourself. I just had this conversation with the Homeless Impact Division team right before this interview, or not right before, but earlier before this interview, and just expressing to them how boosting morale is important, celebrating the wins is important, but also during downtime, we have to step away. I try to surround myself with people that don't know what I do, um, and don't even understand um, how complex this issue is so that we can talk about other day-to-day -to -day topics mm -hmm. um, because it can consume you. I think as a community, we all can agree on the things that we can agree on, like housing, um, needing more available options, needing more funding. Um, where we disagree would be the details. But I think that if more service providers were able to provide better self-care, step outside of our normal day-to-day -day work um, and realize that there's a whole nother world out there that sometimes thinks this body of work should be a little bit more simpler and easy. Well, I wanna thank you all for taking the time to be on the Tennessee Voices podcast. Again, we have Renee Pratt, who's the Executive Director of Metro Social Services, Jay Survey, who's the Interim Director of the Homeless Impact Division, and April Calvin, Assistant Director of the Division. Uh, before I let you all go, any final words uh, for the audience before we conclude? Final words are to this, that we are on mission, on mission, to get people housing each and every day. The mayor fully supports us, uh, Director Pratt fully supports us, and we are on that mission to help collaborate and guide and, and give um, effort to the, the homeless effort and, and being able to get people into housing. And that takes time. So it's not something that you can solve in, in a month, it's not something we can solve in a couple of years, but as long as we're making positive pro uh, progress uh, each and every month, then I feel like my time here has been well served. Uh, this, this, this topic in Nashville is surrounded by government and local and private nonprofits who are given 100% to get there. And always feel free to reach out to our division with questions or with concerns. And we will take that and glad to hear your advice or help you in a, in a hard situation. So we just appreciate you taking time to, uh, to notice us and allow us to get our message out there. So thank you for that today. And I'd like to share one last thing to thank our partners, thank our community partners that engage with us daily. I believe that we all agree and um, can communicate around housing as being housing focused and um, definitely wanting to make sure that everyone knows that we celebrate them, we celebrate the wins, and we celebrate the amount of care that goes into loving our Nashville neighbors. I wanna thank you all again for being on the show. May you stay well and healthy. And again, I'm grateful to you all and a special shout out to Harriet Wallace for her part in getting us all together today. Yes, Have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. All right.